PP, daba internet a las casas en el, dos, en el 1995, perdón, le dijeron que estaba loco porque nadie usaría internet en las casas, se lo vendieron al año 2000 por no sé cuánto. Entonces, él era una persona que sabía de lo que hablaba, había sido emprendedor y nos podía ayudar mucho en nuestro proyecto. Y a partir de aquí, él fue el director general el que nos guió un poco hacia dónde íbamos. Cambios ha habido muchos más, pero quizá el más importante y más curioso es el de IBM, que como no sé si lo sabéis, pero somos los partners en, el System Z, en los servidores System Z, los mainframes, que son grandes servidores para las soluciones de cloud computing y de Linux. La historia de esto también es una historia que también tienes que creer y tienes que, que mirar, porque no fuimos nosotros que fuimos a llamar a la puerta de IBM, sino que fue en el 30 de junio recibimos un email de una tal Andrea que decía que quería hablar con nosotros. Cada día recibimos muchos emails de gente que se piensa que, como somos jóvenes, les venderemos la empresa, les daremos... Y muchas veces hacemos delete, delete, delete. Esta vez hicimos delete. 15 días más tarde recibimos otro email que decía, chicos, soy Andrea Grego de IBM, por favor, llamadme. A partir de aquí nos contó que llevaban seis meses investigando a ellos, habían hecho pruebas de fuerza, habían visto que les gustaba y ahora somos una de las soluciones de, de IOS para, de IBM, perdón, para Cloud Computing. En el sentido de que si tú crees, las cosas van saliendo solas también. O sea, no buscamos, nos buscaron y ahora somos una de las soluciones de, para todo el mundo de IBM. Para un poco así, ahora hemos lanzado IOS 2.0 y es otra, otro avance. Solo que contar ahora un poco sobre la privacidad porque muchas veces... Tomamos la privacidad, hablamos de privacidad y hablamos como una palabra, la privacidad. Para nosotros la privacidad no, no es solo un concepto, sino que es seguridad. Es decir, muchas veces pensamos o nos venden que lo que nos venden a nosotros, los servicios que nos venden son seguros. Esto es en parte verdad, porque desde el momento en que yo mando un archivo a alguien, ya no es seguro, porque este archivo lo tiene alguien. A ejemplos hay muchos. Entonces, lo que nosotros queremos desde ellos es que la seguridad es la base y por eso... Queremos que la gente se lo instale, trabaje con ellos en su servidor. Ejemplos de cómo... O sea, el problema es que nosotros no somos conscientes de, de la seguridad. En febrero de 2009, Facebook anunció que tenía dos... Facebook anunció que se... O se habló de que Facebook se quedaba a los derechos de las fotografías de la gente. Al cabo de un mes, Facebook tenía 600.000 usuarios nuevos. Es decir, nos, nos da igual lo que hagan con nuestros datos. Nosotros creemos que esto es lo que realmente tiene que, que importar y tenemos que ser muy conscientes de ello. Entonces, un poco... Hablando de esto del Open Innovation, como nosotros lo vemos en iOS, es que para el software creemos claramente que el Open Innovation va de la mano del Open Source. Nos sirve para adaptar dentro de nuestro producto Open Source, trabajamos con mejores Open Source de fuera. iOS 2.0 se basa en Cookdo, que es otro, otro proyecto. Es decir, nos podemos basar con proyectos de fuera y así innovar. Ves lo que es mejor de fuera, lo coges y te lo pones en tu producto, es Open Source. Después lo compartes y ellos pueden escoger nuestro iOS y lo pueden adaptar y pueden mejorarlo. Y lo compartirán y así se hace una, una cadena que es muy interesante. Otro hecho es que el hecho de liberar código está demostrado que, que es bueno. Y ejemplos hay de grandes compañías. Microsoft, IBM, han liberado partes de su código. Han liberado partes de su código porque han visto que realmente liberando partes del código es como la gente se pone, en el, se pone en el, a desarrollar y les ayuda y hace que el producto tenga mucho más valor. Es decir, no es que el open source sea una idea de loco, sino que realmente sirve y tiene futuro. Por otro lado, el segundo punto importante es que intentamos adaptar siempre las recomendaciones de nuestros, de nuestros usuarios y de nuestra comunidad, de nuestros clientes. Si ellos nos dicen algo, lo tenemos en una lista, lo apuntamos y sabemos que es realmente una necesidad, lo adaptamos. Esto es muy importante para saber realmente lo que ellos quieren. Y otra cosa importante dentro de esto es que ellos, detrás de una aparente verticalidad, es decir, trabajamos sectorialmente, departamento de negocio, marketing, comunicación, desarrollo, hay una evidente horizontalidad. Todo el mundo tiene derecho, tenemos una, una herramienta para hacer las proposiciones que consideremos oportunas para los cambios. Puede estar un, de, un developer de haciendo algo que si ve que, no le, que puede ser que no sea lo más correcto, se para el proceso se vuelve, y se vuelve a mirar. O sea, es muy importante esta horizontalidad en el sentido de que todo el mundo tiene derecho a opinar y todo el mundo, todos los departamentos pueden y deben ayudar a que el producto tenga mucho más valor y así consigue, conseguimos esta innovación. El tercer punto importante es la, la comunidad. O sea, nosotros colgamos de una comunidad que actualmente está en 45 países y tenemos 600.000 usuarios registrados en el servidor gratuito de iOS, 15.000 usuarios en los foros. Es decir, esta comunidad es la que también nos sirve para innovar. Esta comunidad conoce su realidad. Esta comunidad hace conferencias, hace presentaciones. Este mes tenemos presentaciones en Malasia, tenemos en Venezuela, Colombia, tenemos, en medio mundo tenemos presentaciones. Y esta gente conoce la realidad y son ellos los que desarrollan aplicaciones que les sirven tanto para su comunidad 
pero también sectorizadas dentro de la comunidad. Lo que os decía de, de Lars, ha desarrollado ayer o antes de ayer, hizo una release de una aplicación para matemáticas que sirve para las escuelas de, puede servir para las escuelas alemanas. Es decir, ¿esto se puede adaptar para otros sitios? Sí, pero Lars vio que había esta necesidad y hizo esta, esta adaptación. Es decir, es importante que la, que la comunidad también trabaje y, es, y para nosotros es muy importante todas las 800 aplicaciones, por ejemplo, que hay disponibles y que tú te puedes instalar en tu, en tu iOS. El cuarto punto es otro que considero muy clave. Y es que iOS no solo tenemos nuestra visión, no solo nos realimentamos desde dentro, con lo que vemos desde dentro, sino que nos hemos buscado desde hace tiempo un consejo de consultores externos que nos puedan ayudar. En esto intentamos que haya un perfil muy variopinto. Está desde el director general de Saralí, España. Saralí es la empresa que tiene abanderado a Sanex, o sea, es una gran empresa. Pues esta persona, Albert Martí, también nos ayuda a dar su visión, su manera de ver a ellos, la innovación y hacia dónde debemos ir. Pero por otro lado, también tenemos, por ejemplo, a John Maddock Hall, que es el director ejecutivo de Linux International, y tenemos otros asesores que no quieren que se haga público su nombre. Pero la idea principal, más allá de los nombres, es que sabemos y creemos en lo importante que es el hecho de que no te tengas que quedar tú, sino que sean de fuera también los que te vengan a dar ideas y los que te ayuden. Y por último, otra pieza importante es el tamaño. Nuestro tamaño nos permite somos pequeños, nos permite, nos permite innovar y nos permite hacer movimientos arriesgados que pueden ser muy positivos para la empresa. Es decir, nos permite estar en la vanguardia. Y eso también es un, es un hecho importante. Si nos tenemos que arriesgar para innovar, a veces puede salir bien, a veces puede salir mal, a veces te puede retrasar, a veces hay muchos problemas, pero es realmente importante esto. O sea, en definitiva, las cinco claves que pensamos es que para el Open Innovation en el software es que debemos ser open source, tenemos que adaptar las recomendaciones de fuera y de dentro. Tenemos que tener una comunidad fuerte, unos consultores y nos debemos arriesgar a la hora de cuando queramos, cuando queramos llevar a, termo, a, a cabo las innovaciones. Okay, thanks, Jordi, very much for that. Um, we now move um, to the next phase. I think just before we do, uh, has anybody at this stage got any question they would like to ask about the presentations? Yes? Can, can we get them a mic? Well, uh, your own platform providers and you talked about the opportunities for developers and the great things they can do using your platforms but we've seen platforms um, taking advantage of developers is there a code of ethics or is there a responsibility from a platform provider uh, for example you mentioned uh, Twitter or Facebook uh, we recently saw Twitter uh, building their own uh, URL shortener and throwing out Bitly. Uh, is there a, a commitment from a platform provider that if the next big thing is built on top of their platform, they're not going to compete against it or take advantage of it? Or is there a commitment that the platform will be there in uh, 10 years? Or the terms of, of service won't change? Things like that. <laughs> That's I'll start with that. that that's actually a, a really good question. I think one of the things that's come out of um, something like the open source community is there is a standard, right? There's the GPL, the LG, um, LGPL. There's, there's different um, standards that have been put aside that said, you know, I'm going to put this license out here and I'm going to put my application under this license. And there's some guidelines. And I think on a broader scale, we've not done that as, a, as an industry, as a, as a software industry not related to open source, right? And I call it software, I'll say platform or web services. You know, it'd be great if there was a web services type of licensing that matched very similar to the open source license models. Um, it's, it, it's difficult. It, not changing terms of service is a little tough because a lot of times what, um, what, what I've always pitched companies to do is they go out and talk to them about exposing their APIs is, you know, put stuff out there and see what happens, and then just just put it out there. Because what happens is they spend too many too much time going through legal paperwork 
versus trying to just see what people might innovate on. So they always leave the terms of service a little open. Um, but I think what's more damaging to, to developers, you know, I like the, the code of ethics idea and putting things under certain licenses. Um, but recently, you know, a prime example recently um, is one of the um, platform providers on a mobile device, I won't say who, um, but they stopped analytics companies from being able to use their analytics engines associated with that particular platform. So all of a sudden, you know, they had all these companies built uh, products around an open platform that you could run analytics on and they could sell analytics. And all of a sudden, that, that mobile device company said, nah, -uh, you're going to use our analytics engine. To me, that's crippling, right? That, that's a little different than changing my terms of service, right? Big difference in terms of you just cut, you know, 10 people out of the market that had really interesting products that a lot of companies were using and leveraging. You let them innovate and now you've taken it away. That's a little different. Now them stealing your idea, eh, it's kind of hard. It happens, happens all the time, right? Remember I said that at Alcatel they wanted you to sign like six contracts and they actually wanted, um, we went from, we said, okay, we want to open up the sandbox in the sky just so people could play around. They wanted you to physically sign paper. And I was like, what developer is going to sign a sheet of paper and fax it back to me? Absolutely nobody. So there's finding the balance between that. Um, but it's more like if they like what you're doing, they should um, either work with you, like uh, IBM, right, contacted, contacted you, um, or look at acquisition. Or, or um, one of the things that eBay did early on with their API program was they... Um, people that they thought were doing interesting things, they pulled them in and said, what can we do to give you more? And they would give them access to APIs that nobody else had access to. Um, Facebook does the same thing, but not, not, as, um, not as outwardly as, as, uh, uh, as eBay had done. And then eBay turned it into a whole like tiered program around the level of access you get to APIs. So I, I think there's some things that need to be looked at, but I, I do like the idea of putting together sort of a license or code structure or um, licensing structure around web services so that developers aren't caught. Um, that's the whole reason why that was implemented with open source. Yeah, but I, wanna, I wanna mention, because you're going straight to one of the problems that we're facing right now when we are preparing our terms and conditions is exactly what you were saying is, is uh, uh, are we gonna, are we gonna keep the support to all the applications that are gonna be created with our APIs or not? And uh, the answer is the answer is yes, but we need to to create that stuff. Okay, so we don't have it. We are. Um, uh, what I would like to do is, if it's possible, is to engage with you directly to get directly your feedback and use it with my lawyers because that is something that I appreciate and and, and it's gonna help me to to convince them. And the other point that you mentioned is to think about disrupting the platform or not. No, there is one point. There is nothing in life that lasts forever. Uh, the only way to make it last long is gonna be is gonna be to to make it successful. Of course, if if we are not able to be successful uh, in a few years, somebody is gonna wonder why do we keep on having this alive. So so that is that is like. A, Engaging with a girl, you know, is something that you bet on it or not, okay? <laughs> okay, uh, has anyone got any more questions at, at this stage? If not, I, I've got some questions. We'll get the conversation going. Um, I want to write something down here. Oh. Okay, well, thanks very much for the presentations. Um, I suppose my first reaction is that after hearing all that, Fantastic stuff. I kind of I feel like the dinosaur at the end of the long tail, you know, and uh, just it's just amazing to hear it all. Um, I suppose I, I'll go back a little bit to what I was saying in my presentation, my kind of teaser question, because um, in the um, in the process of um, in a sense, kind of outsourcing the creativity from the core organization to these developer fan bases. Um, is that actually, if that if 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 that developer fan base is is effectively becomes a kind of a, a generic pool of developers uh, that maybe all companies can effectively tap into, then h how does it help then to create the diversity that, that that I was talking about earlier? Is is it an issue? Or Jose, you're looking at me, so you can answer. Hon it. Honestly, I, I don't think it's an issue actually. Yeah. 
I, th I think it's good that uh, well, the developers are out there and they're going to have access to several uh, platforms. And that the only thing that is going to come out of that is real richer products. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, honestly, I do believe in ma in machine app as as the as the way to create new things. So for example. Um, the guys of iOS are here and have presented their product that I, I knew from a long time ago, and it's a fantastic product. So um, why cannot they use the APIs that Telefonica is going to expose in order to create something better? Or, or even the developers that are working with them right now creating applications for the iOS, why cannot they use our, I don't know, LBS, SMS, or, or advertising platform to, yeah. to create some of the stuff? I, I do think yeah. that... Uh, as far as we are able to be really open and we're able to really keep uh, on providing the same services and keep them in time, that is going to be better for the developers. Yeah, yeah I right. think it just to add to that, th there's a couple of things. Um, one of them is um, exposing the assets to developers or exposing web services to developers so they can build stuff on top of it for companies. What that actually, or, or whether you're a startup or whether you're a large company, it helps you with sort of time to market, right? If you think about, I want to build a product, I want to get it out there, I need to make money, I need to be different, I need to have an impact. So some of it's about time to market. When, when a company called Netflix in the US opened up their API to all the content, they're a movie uh, rental company, you, you download them off the web, you run them on your Wii or your Xbox. Um, but what, they've, what they did was they actually had three mobile apps were built in the first two days that they had released their API. They never had to go build those mobile apps. Those were done for them. Um, then they got a bunch of other really interesting app applications built, but they were all things that the community did, and they benefited from it. So, well, yes, in the long run, other people might do the same thing or might do similar things. I think some of it's just you know getting it started and, and driving the interest in the innovation. And then the second part of it is, so there's time to market and getting new ideas. But then, okay, doesn't everybody have the same ideas? But I think they don't. I think people's ideas build on top of each other. So the more ideas that happen, the more things that get there. One of the interesting things that happened with the idea walls that we were doing is people would come in and they would read the ideas on the idea wall and they'd be like, well, that's great, but it'd also be cool if the application could do this. And so people are building on top of it. So you don't, you actually advance uh, the creativity versus you know, everybody ended up with the same thing. No, to share go. ideas, to this is, is the, the most interesting thing of, of this project. We are open source, they are not open source, but the, the philosophy is a similar way. In a, they work in a similar way, and this is the interesting. We have forums, you have an idea, you can share the idea. It's like campus parties, this idea also is, I have an idea, and I share the idea with other people. This is the idea, it's yeah. this is the interesting point of mm. to share and to to have a more yeah. complete product. And the, inter the interface for the fan base of developers is presumably with the, the development manager or VP of development as you are, Laura, in, in your company. So that's the kind of interface. That's as far um, up the tail as the fan base goes at the moment. But there is, I mean, I see this creating kind of changes in business models on both sides, both for the type of telephonicas of this world, but also for the way developers have worked. So over a period of, I don't know, a business generation, whatever that is, do you see that there will be representatives of this fan base actually having more influence up the chain at the strategic side of the business? Or Yeah, I mean, th the interesting thing, so what we did when we um, built the team at Alcatel Lucent that's working on the developer program is we actually took people from the community that were in the developer community and brought them in. We didn't try to take a bunch of telco people and say, okay, be creative. What we did is we brought in uh, Ross Turk, who's sitting over there somewhere. Ross is going to do a presentation later on, uh, on telco APIs. But, but we brought Ross in. He used to run SourceForge, right? So Ross Turk was community manager at SourceForge. Then he brought his buddy over from Slashdot, so one of the guys that was community manager at Slashdot. So bringing that developer community into the company and making them a part of changing the organization is the only way that these companies are going to change. Mm -hmm. We also took, um, uh, Red, we have this guy, Reg, who's on our team, and uh, I'm sure you guys eventually will meet Reg, but he, uh, he came to us from Scout, which was one of the very first successful iPhone apps. Uh, they got written up in Forbes magazine, and they really had taken off. And we brought him in because, and, and now he works with us, it works for us, but we brought him in because he was able to say, look, 
This doesn't work about your business model. This is why I used an over-the-top player. This is the challenges that we had with distribution. So I have a slide that I showed yesterday that said sort of the three challenges that needed to be solved, right? One was discoverability, one was distribution, and one was monetization. Those came from Reg, right? He's like, I'm a developer, and I, you know, I tried to build a company as an entrepreneur, and these are the things that I need to do. And so I think as companies, it, the models will change, and the developers will have more impact on those models, um, but not until people start bringing them in, right? Mm -hmm. Bringing them into the fold closer and making them part of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And this is true. We are the open source, and we have the community, and we have the the main office, but we try to to separate the community and the office, our strategy is different, and we will not, we try to not be influenced by the community. For example, with the 2.0 release, mm -hmm. we have a lot of recommendations, a lot of things with the community. The community wants to collaborate, wants to develop the 2.0, but for us it was inter important to develop the 2.0 version from the main office and not with the community. We think that. It's in, it's interesting to to separate this the community and the strategy, mm -hmm. and maybe there are some points where the community can can help and can and it's very important. I have explained uh, all yeah. the things we have, the translation have a lot of things from the community, but it's also interesting to know that if you want to have a, a real product, you have to separate this uh, almost an, an open source project. Yeah, yeah, I understand. The the reason I ask is because. Um, I have a theory or observation that uh, a lot of companies put art in the boardroom, but companies never uh, invite artists to board meetings, you know? So I'm just curious with this, uh, and it's relating a bit to the question earlier, is like how hands-on, hands-off corporate-wise are are these systems working? But but that is that is changing. Well, the first yeah. thing is that the big companies like Telefonica is, is investing a lot of time and effort into into creating platforms for developers. But it's not only about the platform for developers. There is a huge stream of work right now, in, at least in my company, and, and it's happening in other companies, to bring in talent that we don't have in. It's what they call, they call it Profile 2.0, yeah. but the name is okay. Uh, there, is, there is already people that is coming to the company in, in Telefonica. I can mention some names, that guys that have been brought to Telefonic R&D and that are right now really influencing the whole company, and they come from the developer world. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and now we are getting more connected with developers all around the place. So what I would expect is that in, in two years, developers will really become influencers, big influencers in such a, mm -hmm. a big company like Telefonica. And I, I guess that is going to happen in other companies. And this is not a model that we are inventing right now. This model has been invented before, invented before by, for example, Procter & Gamble. Or by I don't know Ferradria in his yeah. restaurant in Buji. He's been doing this for a very long time, bringing people in to bring new ideas. So why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think one of the, one of the interesting things for me was we uh, we wanted to go to this South by Southwest event, uh, and and when I first joined, we we signed up for well, we wanted to sign up for it, uh, and we kept getting pushback from the company. Uh, the company said. Uh, you know, no, 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 that's, that's a big drink fest. You, you, we can't go there. We don't want to be seen as part of that. No, no, no. And I was like, no, no, we, we should really go. And uh, I kept getting pushed back. So finally, I, I kind of hired a company to go and put together the program for me and didn't really tell anyone. And next thing you know, I was like, hey, we're going to South by Southwest. And all of a sudden, a few of the, the board members, seriously, the board members, the what's called our, our executive management team, uh, showed up at South by Southwest because they wanted to see what this thing was all about and why it was so important that I kind of went behind their back to get it done and to actually go there. And so a few of them showed up and they were just amazed at the, the innovation and the ideas and the conversations that happened. And it's just completely changed the face of the company in terms of thinking about working and interacting directly with de developers. And the other part of it is our, our CEO, we had a, a meeting a couple of days ago and he came into the meeting and we were talking about some of the changes we were trying to make. And his point was, you guys aren't trying hard enough to make change. And they said, what do, you, what do you mean we're not trying hard enough to make change? He said, no one's yelling at me yet. He said, until I have people in the company yelling at me about what you're doing with developers, it's not good enough. So I actually thought that was a really good change. So I think we're seeing it in some of the companies where change is actually happening. Mm -hmm. 
I think in more traditional companies like telco that have been around for a long time, it's taking longer. And where that's coming from, especially in the telco space, is you remember, you, you pick up your phone, right? You expect a dial tone. If there's no dial tone, you're like, uh oh, my phone's broken, this darn phone company, right? We're, we're a little more used to it now with mobile devices, but I think they've always been so used to having to be always on and giving, you know, you know, I'll, I'll, instead of five nines, I'll call it 10 nines uptime. And so it really put them at this super uber cautious state. And they've just taken a lot longer to get out of it than most companies. One, one small comment, uh, quick comment. Uh, uh, not, a, not a long time ago, Telefonica O2 in the UK bought Yaya, the voice over IP company. Okay, the internet voice company, it's not a voice over IP company. That is based in, in San Francisco and, and Israel. Uh, why do you think they bought this company? They bought it because of the technology or they bought it because of the people? I just raise that question or leave it open, okay? Uh, okay, well, if you want to say more there, Laura? Are you okay? No, I no. mean, you know, to that point, right? Oh. So y you guys bought Yaya and then you've got uh, BT bought Ribbit, right? Wonder what's going to happen with Twilo. But it, it's to that point, right? Skype, right? It, you look at these companies, what, what they're trying to do is bring in they want the culture, it's whether or not the culture can be brought in and adapted to, and I think that's a good part of it, right? You need people like Jose and Telefonica who are just, you know, okay, we're gonna change the world, and I'm gonna bring in these people to help me change the world, and, and this is how it works. We do things fast, we innovate, we bring developers in, we engage with them, um, but just not everyone's used, used yeah. to participating in that environment. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not the first time I've heard a situation you know, where you know, kind of a blue chip corporate organization is, is um, kind of underestimating how articulate developers uh, can be simply because they just never go and talk to them. But um, I mean, based on all that you've been talking about, I mean, I guess we'll probably have to wrap up uh, soon. Um, has enough actually gone to market using this process um, to indicate that kind of brand perception of large organizations like Telefonica has been improved as a direct result of this? Can you measure that? Uh, there are some numbers out there to measure mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But uh, honestly, if, if, we, if we really talk about open innovation, I don't want to bring numbers in. I do believe in the approach of Jordi, is your name, Jordi? Yeah. I do believe in the approach of Jordi. I do believe in what we're doing. I strongly believe in it, and I'm going to keep on pushing it without really thinking about how much money is behind. Mm -hmm. The money will come. There will be, if it's the money coming, or is people calling, or is something is going to happen we're going into the right direction. So I, I wouldn't bet on saying yeah. it's going to be 5%, 10%, or 20% of a company in the future. What I'm going to say is that it's going to represent a dramatic change in the way we do yeah. things and in the way we will. Yeah. yeah, I think it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the, um, you know, the money, the revenues, the profits. It was more the perception of, of the brand, you know, just from the fact this is going on, you know, are generally your, your customers you know, is there a perception of, of, of the company th increasing actually, or that, improving? that yeah. question should, should be answered by, by Jordi, not by me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> by Jordi, I see. <laughs> two, two <laughs> wow. <laughs> I am an open source. <laughs> I am from open source. Well, it's difficult to... It, it depends, I think, on a lot of, of, of things. Uh, First of all, it's a, the, the geographical situation. Open source, it's not known on Spain, mm -hmm. but it has a different perception on, on Europe and has a different perception on the India. <coughs> because I talk with people from all around the world and it's very different. If I go to the to Cibeles and I ask someone, yeah. what's open source? Wow, hacker, something bad. But no, this is real. We we have meetings with uh, bank uh, with banks and they sa we said we are open source uh, with IBM with IBM and they say wow open source but open source it's bad there are two things it's bad or it's free but there is no other way but it dep it's the perception Telefonica can do this and the per it's, it's difficult to say if the perception will change I don't know it's I it's think that it will not change Telefonica has a it will change it. That uh, the their goals, their their apps, uh, this will change. But 
the the perception I think that it will be the same. Telefonica is a monster on Spain and on the wall, and it's it's te wow, Telefonica. It's for some pe people it's bad, yeah, and for yeah. some people it's good. And is it perceived to be a cooler yeah, company? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but it's no Telefonica will <laughs> will change the the, app, the 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 development, the ideas, the innovation. But this is not for the for the people. This is for for the mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. company. I think it's mm -hmm. different. Okay. There are, uh, honestly, um, if I'm into this, it's because I really believe that we can change something. Uh, I was asking to you because you are actually you are going to be the the devil's advocate into this in the in the next years. The customers will feel it afterwards, but uh, I strongly believe that changing the process of of bringing creativity in the company can really shape the company in a different in a different way, and it has been demonstrated by all the companies in the world. Like, I don't know. Mm, Apple did it in a certain moment. Uh, no, but it's, it's an example of a big company of changing the paradigm. Oh, yeah. Open innovation. Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's see. There's big. There are big. There are big monsters out there that can change. And I, I, if we're betting into this, is because we believe that this big monster called Telefonica can change in, in the future because of this. So. Uh -huh. You are not doing. You are not doing this to change the perception. No, it's not the goal, no? no. The main goal. It's not this. It may, come. It may but it I think that it's not your goal. We your goal is uh, it's to innovate, to create, to develop new apps, to have more products, and it's it's good. But it's the goal. It's not to, no. Yeah, I mean, I think anyone that opens up um, APIs and wants to recruit developers in, their goal is is typically, if it's a big company, it's to engage the consumer. Right, it's to engage the end consumer, um, and they're doing it through the developer community, and 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 that's that's just that's a fact, right? And hopefully they've given developers a way if 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 they're going to help me as a company uh, make more money from my end consumer, then I should let them make money, right? And that's the whole money flow thing. Mm -hmm. Now, open source, it's funny because um, uh, open source has free, and then there's free as in free beer, and right there's there's levels of free with open source. <laughs> and, and open source isn't about being free unless you're talking to Richard Stallman, right? So open source is really about, uh, you know, collaborating, crowdsourcing on development and using some of it for free, but then turning it into a business. You wanted to make money from what you were doing. Same thing like Amy that does mobile development. These guys want, want to make money, right? I always say developers want either fame or fortune. And, and fame is, hey, we got acquired by IBM. Fortune is, hey, we got acquired by IBM. <laughs> right? So um, it, it's, a, it's, it, you know, it, it's really just looking at it as how can everybody in the value chain benefit from what's happening in the industry? So, yeah, I mean, it, the goal isn't, you know, uh, our goal isn't to make the developer wealthy. Our goal is to, I, I want this guy to continue to buy hardware from me. And the way he's going to do that is if his customers are more engaged in his network and use more network, then they're going to buy more product from me. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to let the developer make money so that he can make money so he buys from me. Right? There, there, is, a there is a supply chain, right here. value chain right here. Right? Yeah. And, and that's, that's the goal. And, and yeah. nobody's kidding themselves. That's, uh, open source is the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the good part is open source has had 10 years plus, more than that, but it's had a long time to build structure around it. And the structure becomes with the licenses. The structure comes with the business model. So I used to run something called the Software Development Forum uh, a few years ago. And we held the very first open source think tank. And the whole point about the think tank was, what are the business models? And the question was, is open source a business model or a development model? And that was a topic in 2003. Right, 2003, the question was, is it a business model or is it a development model? Turns out, it's a business model, right? Mm -hmm. And the same thing with all this open API stuff is going to be about it's a business model. And so it's finding that right business model that's going to end up making everybody successful. Okay, I think unless there's any other questions, there's one there. We have a, oh, can you drop it down? Goodbye. Hola, yo estoy creando una startup para la catalización y el desarrollo eh, para catali 
Sí, estoy creando una, una startup para catalizar el desarrollo y la adquisición de conocimiento. Y uh, bueno, perdonad si, si habéis hablado ya de esto porque he llegado un poco tarde a la conferencia, pero me gustaría saber si podéis dar algún consejo. Eh, eh, yo estoy muy interesado en, en el Open Access, pero quería saber eh, cómo podemos hacer para, que, para abrir el código y que, eh, para que la gente, los de desarrolladores puedan usarlo, pero que las grandes compañías como Microsoft o Google pues, eh, no eh, tengan ventaja de, pues, de esto. Uh, do you want me to speak in English? Quizá, o sea, el hecho de abrir el código y que no, o sea, por lo que he entendido, quieres abrir el código, pero que no te lo copie en Google y Microsoft. O sea, el hecho de que sea open source, te pueden robar la idea, pero no te pueden robar el, la idea te la podían coger, pero el código no. La GPL3, que es la que usamos nosotros, si cogen el si Cualquier, cualquier persona coge el código, cualquier empresa coge el código, tiene la obligación de cualquier modificación que haga, publicarla. Por ejemplo, hace cuatro meses vimos que Sefer, que es una operadora francesa, había cogido iOS, lo había modificado, lo había adaptado para sus clientes y lo usaban para... Con el ordenador podías enviar SMS, sincronizar la agenda. ¿Qué hicimos? Dejamos el Sefer, perdón. iOS es, no es nuestro, es de la comunidad, o sea, iOS es open source. Tienes que publicar el código y ahora el código está publicado. Es decir, lo que tienes que hacer es hacerlo open source y a partir de aquí te pueden coger la idea, pero el código no te lo cogerán. No se puede, o si se modifican una línea de código, los puedes denunciar. O sea, es la, es la licencia. Básicamente esta es la idea. Open source yo creo que por lo que dices es la solución más válida. No se me ocurre nada más. Como, o haces un grupo secreto o algo, pero esto no, no lo veo válido. But um, I wish I could speak Spanish. <laughs> but, but, but that's why I said there's, there's structure around the open source model. There's not structure, standardized structure around the rest of the industry for open APIs, right? So the web services industry needs to take on some of that concepts or that the open source community had. And, and, and you know, it'd be a great initiative. And gosh, we should start that. Jose, what do you think? Because, <laughs> because it, it really, I mean, we probably more than anybody in the telco space, you know, the intellectual property stuff is is crazy, and and if they knew that there was some restrictions and standardized industry guidelines around it, it'd probably make it a lot easier. But right now, when most people create the terms of service, honest here, when they create terms of service, they go and they copy them off of somebody else's website, modify them based on what they think it should be, and then reuse that. So, so clearly there needs to be some standardization, but that's the only way we're going to get there. One more thing. Well, antes hablaban de, de los términos de, de servicio, de las aplicaciones. Nosotros sí que tenemos muy claro es que la comunidad es la comunidad y lo que haga la comunidad no lo podemos coger así como así y venderlo a un cliente. Es decir, lo que sí que hacemos es que cuando una aplicación la queremos, no es ni vender al cliente, es cuando una aplicación la queremos poner por defecto en una release, pedimos permiso y firman los términos de servicio conforme están de acuerdo en que esta aplicación la ponemos en la release. Es decir, somos open source, pero siempre con el respeto del, del desarrollador. Es, no queremos cogerlo, poner, ah, han hecho qué guapo esto, que nos ha, está súper bien, lo ponemos en la release. No, le preguntamos, ¿quieres que lo pongamos en la release? ¿Hay algún problema? Si sí, no, y lo ponemos y él firma unos acuerdos. Es decir, que también tenemos que sea open source no quiere decir que no haya términos de, de servicio, o sea, ni acuerdos. Well, um, <clears throat> I would like your opinion about another type of fragmentation I'm seeing here today, which is um, like a year ago, everything was much more simpler because we only had one app store, which was Apple's. And now, a year later, uh, I mean, there's app stores everywhere. There's everyone opening their APIs. There's handset makers like Nokia, which I was on a presentation just before this one, which has, a, has its own app store. Then there's Apple, and then there's the telcos also uh, opening up with their own app stores. So I guess now I don't know where to turn myself to. Um, 
So my question is, do you think this, there's this fragmentation, I mean, there will be a joining of efforts or how I, as a developer, can maximize my efforts to reach the maximum number of customers and that's it. Thank you. You're having to an strategic uh, question, so it's, uh, it's difficult to answer. Uh, but the first thing is that ev everybody is, is going now in this direction because it, it really makes sense to enhance customers' lives with applications. And, and everybody wants to bring the value to the customer. Okay, So I understand Nokia trying to do it, Apple, Google, and, and Telefonica. Okay, uh, About what is going to happen in the future, I, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, what I see is that well, uh, what is going to happen is that there's going to be a, a value provided to the customer coming from different sites. So there's going to be value coming from from the web, value coming from the telco, and value coming from from a pure uh, device uh, software. So so that is that is going to that is going to facilitate to to enhance applications that are going to be given to the customer, and and the customer is going to choose. The customer is the sovereign about whatever he wants to to do. So the customer is going to be the one aiming to one. As, as I do understand that uh, uh, these three uh, vectors of the same equation are uh, important for the customer, might happen that there will be some kind of con concentration. But this is something that the, the market is going to evolve by itself. If I would have the crystal ball, I would bet on the winner, but I don't know. I don't have it. So I, I do believe that the, the situation right now is, is good. It's good for you and it's good for the customer because he can choose. And uh, and it will evolve naturally, and we'll see. Okay. So I think there's a, a couple of things there, right? So one of them is, first of all, the APIs. Uh, there's different protocols, right? So we've seen REST has kind of come to the top, and the interesting transformation uh, for many of the telcos has been they've exposed APIs for a long time, um, but we've exposed them in Parlay X. Who knows Parlay X, right? So. The first phase has been moving all to, to REST because that's been the adopted uh, protocol. The second phase of it has been the GSMA 1 API and OMA who are trying to create standard interfaces so that every telco uses the same set of interfaces for you to write to, right? So that's another phase of it. Another phase is um, there are several aggregators. We've launched our own aggregation service and our aggregation service is you write to this single API and then it runs across multiple networks, right? That way you as a developer don't have to write an API that makes a different network call to every network provider. You write to the application, it determines what network it's on and then it calls the API to that particular network. I think the other part of it um, is it, it comes from, you know, you talked about the app stores. And it's funny you say that because I was at a company called um, Symbian before I came here. And uh, Symbian actually created something called Horizon. The notion behind Horizon was that it was a, a place where developers, anybody that built a Symbian-based app, would upload the application. You'd get it tested and certified, and hopefully sooner than the three months it used to take, hopefully a couple of weeks. Get it tested and certified, and then you'd publish automatically to stores. So it was a publishing platform. Now, it was just for Symbian devices, so it had some limitations, right? So you'd only get published to Symbian stores. But it was a first attempt at doing some of that. Um, at Alcatel, we're looking at doing the same thing, but thinking about it more broadly, right? So m across devices, across all app stores. Um, and when I say all devices, I don't just mean mobile. So there's mobile devices, there's DVRs, right? Because there's things like IPTV, then there's going to be the connected car. So thinking broadly in terms of scope, in terms of how do you let a developer, again, just like you want to write once and publish anywhere, can you upload and certify once and publish anywhere? Now, where that becomes an issue, and we actually, Jose and I talked about this the other day, um, where it becomes an issue is every store owner has different guidelines by which they, again, it kind of goes back to terms of service, right? Every guidelines by which they do certification. And I think there's an opportunity there to standardize about 80% of that certification and testing um, versus, uh, you know, the, the other 20%, we can then leave to the individual store owner. But th that's where it needs to get to. Okay, looking around now, hopefully we can uh, start to wrap up if we have no more questions. Um, anything else that you guys want to deal with? Hmm? Yep. 
So, uh, well, obviously, I'd like to thank my three contributors here, and um, I hope you enjoy the uh, the session. And um, I guess it's probably time for lunch, so we should probably uh, st stop now. And um, you're welcome. I'm going to back go back and play with my Lego. That wasn't quite didn't quite work. Okay, right, thank you very much.